This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And Life Saving Systems Corporation, we do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern. They dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are here to bring your agency up to date with the most current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With a certified flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am one of them, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has also partnered with Petzl to assist with personal protective equipment and the highly specific Lazard. SR3 also goes beyond the helicopter world as they provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com or over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. And Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets, the litters, and of course, the most popular hook in all helicopters the D-Lock. The team at LSE will cut, bend, sew, weld, and machine these products into existence every day. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at rescue gear. That's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. Our next guest is the first guy I have coming from France. And actually, I had a chance to sit down face-to-face with him, which was even more fun for me because I don't get to do that very often. So my friend, Terry Didat, was a pilot for the French Navy and then eventually the French Coast Guard. He also flew outside of that in Kazakhstan and down with me in Saudi Arabia. We've had a great time together, and the greatest part about it is even though our countries were different that we flew in and that we learned in, When him and I got into the helicopters together, it was on point. We knew the exact thing that each of us were going to do. A little bit of terminology difference, but that's okay because when you get into the jam of it, man, we hit it hard and we went strong. So please enjoy the stories from my friend, Mr. Terry Didat. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Real Rescue Podcast. With me today, sitting with me right here, is my friend Thierry Didat, who is from France and used to fly with the French Coast Guard. French Navy and French Coast Guard. Both. Which is the same entity. Same but different? They, they, they are same but different. They don't do, we don't do the same missions. Oh. But Coast Guard is dedicated to search and rescue. See that? All right. Mm. Wait, I'm sorry. Coast Guard is dedicated to search and rescue? Search and rescue. The Navy, we have, the, we have multiple missions, including search and rescue. Okay. Coast Guard is just search and rescue having in uh you are you have the responsibility of the zone oh okay the france is divided into uh five zones yeah 
In each zone, there is a Coast Guard station that we call in French service public, public service. Public service, okay. And service the, public. Sorry, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate a bunch of this. Cause yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, man, I love you. Come on, baby. <laughs> so at my time, those places were geared by Dolphin and the same than your yeah. Coast Guard, yeah. not the same engines. Right. But the so same helicopters. This, yeah, same helicopter, but um, Frenchized is vo- yeah. versus Americanized. And exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you guys actually have a better helicopter style. Um, I don't know about now. I think it's pretty comparable now. But the first one that that the U.S. got from France was like the French helicopter was awesome, and then the Coast Guard got it, and they had to Americanize the helicopter by making it fifty one percent American. Yeah, you know, parts, engines, gearbox, so on and so forth, and it. And That's it the H sixty five on your side. Yep. Yeah, for us, we began with the Dolphin N, so it's basic aircraft, no complicated autopilot. We didn't have a great uh, flight director, great coupler, so we had to. Uh, it's a it's a three cues. We didn't have uh, the full four axes. Oh, so yeah. we had to train to go to the over by night by hand. We didn't have any trans down. <laughs> so still those helicopters are operated, but also we have in some of those zones, we have the NH-90 okay. in the English Channel. And we have Dolphin N3 fully capable to trans down. So nice. Yeah. Nice. So but before then, good you, you had to actually fly the aircraft. Yeah, and they made uh, they made the threshold experience for uh, the pilots going from the navy to this special coast guard yeah. uh, detachment, yeah. which was two thousand five hundred hours. You did two thousand five hundred hours just to get into the, ne- to the yeah the, coast guard. The minimum for the captains was that. Wow! Because oh, that's cool. Because the the equipment of the helicopter. Uh, was not fully 100% satisfactory. Okay. So we had to have experienced guys to conduct search and rescue over the sea, going low level by hand, nice. not assisted. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's solid. That's solid work. Yeah. The only assistant we have is the co-pilot <laughs> to manage the height. <laughs> When we you are know, in hover. And, and I've seen stickers in the aircraft that says co-pilot, sit down, shut up, don't touch anything. So uh, they, <laughs> In my time, they were allowed to do. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. especially so. the, 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 the collective pitch. Yeah. They, were the, they were the manager of the height when, uh, when we were involved in doing some survival pickup. Yeah. You are busy looking outside. Your height can vary. And whenever you go, let's say below 50 feet, the copilot takes the, co- the collective pitch and says, I'm going back to 50. So it's a kind of nice. coupler, yeah. but human one. Yeah. That I was mean, one of the procedure we set to balance the lack of, of axes of nice. cues. You know, I, there's, there's a lot of respect for that too. You know, I, a couple of the cases I had, it was, co-pilot was backing up the pilot and it was basically the two of the guys up front flying it together in the case you and I did it was kind of similar we were a lot of talk between you and Chris and and all that going on the whole time man that's that's pretty awesome well man uh well before we go too much deeper tell everybody who you are where you're from and and how you got into search and rescue so I am Thierry Didat I am a former French Navy pilot before that I was an air traffic controller with the internal recruitment, I could jump into the pilot side. Did my course in 1988. Uh, ended my course in 91. Uh, I was dedicated on uh, uh, doing basic search and rescue, what we call coastal one, on the Alouette. The so Alouette. just by day, yeah. Alouette 3, just yeah. by day. Uh, pollution reports as well, so really basic missions. But using the Alouette without any GPS, without anything, just <laughs> the dead reckoning method. So we had to see the coast, <laughs> at least. So that was my don't first. Don't go too far out. Don't no, don't go too far. Go too far. 
but we did some good uh, missions and um, then I went to the WG-13 Navy Links where I spent almost seven years I did all my qualifications in on the uh, on this helicopter I did uh, the main missions were anti-submarine and anti-sub anti-surface warfare as a secondary missions we had to do the uh, maritime counter-terrorism we had to do the search and rescue and we were trained for that and we did many uh, even in the deep sea from the frigate because the WG-13, the Lynx, the Navy Lynx was uh, assigned on board uh, anti-submarine frigates going all over the world so wow. at the end of uh, this uh, period I went to the uh, public service, the uh, Coast Guard Okay. in 1999 uh, where I used the I flew on the uh, dolphin and did many many search and rescue pollution reports uh, narco traffic uh, whatever is dedicated in the zone my zone was the uh, English Channel between France and England nice covering from the Mont Saint Michel which is the west of Normandy till the east of Normandy, up to England. Wow. And we were sharing the zone from England with the search and rescue helicopters, and at this time was CHC okay. S61. So we were sometimes involved in search, airplane search or ship search with the CHC S61 uh, helicopters. Okay. And a few years after, I was in CHC. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then from 91 to 2002 and and then I went to the Middle East as an instructor in Abu Dhabi on the Panther which is the military dolphin with the four axes now full trans down and I was among the mission we had to teach was the search and rescue as well nice then Saudi Arabia in Jeddah in the Saudi Navy teaching the search and rescue and all the anti-surface, anti-submarine, etc. on the dolphin as well. Which and they, they, don't, they don't find dolphins in Saudi Arabia anymore. Do they, they do, yeah. They do, they're still here? They do on the west, in the Red Sea, they ah, do the okay. dolphin and they have dolphin uh, search and rescue. Nice, I thought it was all like 225 and... No, no. And, okay. And then, cool. uh, and then I, I went to the... I took my retirement in 2007 and went in 2008 in uh, CHC, Kazakhstan, Malaysia. Is that where you started with flying the 139? The f yes, the one f uh, 139 was in 2010, yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's it. And then uh, when we were all laid off from CHC because of the oil crisis in 2016, we lost a lot of operations. I went back to Abu Dhabi to be an instructor where I was in 2002 and then uh, in 2008 so that's from 2017 early 17 till the end of 18 then i i joined aramco nice in the search and rescue unit <laughs> which uh which has been an interesting ride for both of us <laughs> yeah we met i met many guys yeah with yeah, many horizons a lot of good guys here and, and this is where we had an opportunity to fly together so it's yes been, it's been a good time so nice well, to back up to when you first got in the Coast Guard or the French Coast Guard from the Navy, public service, uh, do you remember your very first SAR case? I saw in the, f in the public service or in the Navy? Uh, it depends. Where, let, let's go to the, you know what, either one. Because I guess wherever you did your very first search and rescue case, it's funny, like some people talk about their, uh, I saved a dog or I just got deployed in the yeah. day, So And some so, people don't remember, but... I, so in that case, in the public service, I, uh, my f very first one, this one I remember very well because it was funny. Uh, it, was a, it was a fisherman from a fishing vessel. Uh, he was supposed to be very injured. And when we came and picked him up, uh, we dropped him at the hospital and he was working perfect. I was wondering what he has. And he, was, he got a sting from a stingray. Oh. So his hand was big, was inflated, 
and oh, I think it was enough. it was not really uh, Medevac because it was close to the coast coastline, close to a port, but they they said it's an emergency, so it was a good training for us because it's always good to to hoist on the fishing vessel. Yeah, lot of obstructions. Right. It's never the same case. We always have to hoist from the bow, yeah. asking the the, pilot, the, 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 the the ship, the skipper to take a specific heading for us to be hoisting at five o'clock. Yeah. So it's never it's it's never easy, even by day. Right. Yeah. Man, that's, that's pretty it. cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a funny one. Yeah. <laughs> Dude got hit by a stingray. Oh yeah. man, my hand's falling up. Then it's my very first one. We <laughs> were cold and I was washing my car at the station. <laughs> so I had to stop and, and jump in the helicopter. <laughs> man, I got soap on my car. I gotta rinse it off yeah. first. Oh, I had sorry. to redo it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Man, that's funny. Um, so obviously in your all your time I'll tell you what, if you got one out of the Navy, that would be pretty cool too. Uh, I, I'm all ears. No, from the Navy, it's also the, the one uh, we, the first one I did was also exactly on a fishing vessel. Uh, a fisherman hurt, I think he, he was hurt, I don't remember, by th at the hand or at the leg, but we had to transfer him uh, with a stretcher. and. And that was this fishing vessel was very obstructed by cables and uh, everything in I mean within two meters height from the deck, so we had to transfer him from the bow, but with the stretcher the the fishing vessel was too small, so we had to install the stretcher like on the on the on the ramp and uh, we took him from from there like uh, having a side hoisting initially from the ramp like uh, a flare oh yeah yeah like, yeah so that was uh, that was a good one and i remember well because the, the guys had the headache to say yeah we cannot transfer this guy from from this small fishing vessel said yeah let's try from the bow because it's too obstructed even on the bow there was the cabin was closed, so there yeah. were big antennas yeah. from the cabin. So we had to be very high. And it was also an interesting transfer by uh, the stretcher by the hoist. Wow, yeah. that's very so, interesting. So out of curiosity, because I'm, I'm, you know, you're talking about it. If you were to paint that picture of the helicopter, were you at it like a 90 degree? So you, were, you are at 5 o'clock. That means your nose is pointing to the to the aft stern okay like you are hoisting going backward yeah so the difficult thing is when the sea state is heavy having the ship in that configuration yeah. is surfing on the wave so you have to anticipate the surf on the wave otherwise you will overfly the ship so you have to go backward at the same time yeah at five o'clock so you have to to give instruction to this guy to turn on a specific heading to have the wind coming from five o'clock okay in so you can be in a hover in that direction yeah and then you just have to follow the ship the most difficult thing is when it's night you don't see the swell oh right right so if it's so, a big swell coming so if the big swell is coming the the ship will uh, will surf on that so you have to be even more careful yeah maybe higher and try to anticipate the the period of the waves so wow. you know when it will surf and you anticipate that yeah you know and actually so the the case that you and i did out here one of them with that in particular vessel we um the vessel was going we were both basically going in the same direction the whole time. so we were yeah we were doing this hoist operation at 11 o'clock Yes. That means 30 degrees from the ship, uh, alongside the ship to right. the left. Right. Um, when I saw the picture of this ship before taking off, I told Chris, maybe we'll have, because we, we saw it was congested by Ukraine, etc. Yeah. I told him, maybe we will have to do that at five o'clock. And rotate it basically. And on. ask, I, it will, it, because I was the co pilot at this time, I would have calculated the exact heading for the ship yeah. to put the wind at five o'clock. Yeah. Which is because what you guys said. I would have, because this guy isn't able to say. 
Yeah. The driver is not able. Right. We we have to say there is a quick calculation. You take the wind. Yep. You take the opposite of the wind and you add 40 degrees. Let's say the wind is north. Yep. The opposite is south. Right. You ask the ship to go 220 heading, 225. And then you will have the wind at 5 o'clock. Wow. Quick calculation. Well, so good. Chris said... I'm not very comfortable with that. I've not done that, but it can be an opportunity. Yeah. It can be an op an option. When we came to this ship, we saw that actually the crane was a little bit offset to the right. right. There was a good zone on the on the left side, on the port side of the ship. So we decided to do it at eleven o'clock. Yeah, but Otherwise, to have that option, like I, I, I've gone backwards like that on on some of my hoists and stuff just throughout my career, but. It's, that's not standard for me, but hearing that, you guys did that quite often. Quite often. Yeah, that's. that's I want impressive. to say almost 100% of the time on wow. a fishing vessel, the fishing vessel, always the back part of the fishing vessel is busy with cables, with drums, with nets, yeah. etc. Right, right. You have yeah. nowhere to transfer someone. No, it's really, just the bow. the bow. The bow is like the best spot. So you it. cannot do at 11 o'clock because you will lose the sight. Yeah. You cannot be overhead. Right. A ship without and, seeing it. And now you don't have so the only option is that. Yeah. So if you guys lose reference up front, that's a bad day for us in the back as well. So, exactly. So that's yeah. all the transfer that I've done on a fishing vessel or an obstructed vessel on the on his backside was at five o'clock. No. On the submarine yeah. in the navy, we were always doing at five o'clock. Because the longest part of a submarine is not the front, it's the back back one with a fin at oh, the extremity yeah, yeah, that's right. so this is your reference yeah oh, wow oh i like that i like yeah. that a lot yeah man that that's that that's good <laughs> holy cow see this is why i talk to you this is good yeah. stuff um do you remember some of your like some of the cases that you've done i know there's some stuff that stands out to you because you and i have had conversations about stuff before but you know yeah, what, what are two of them that you want to tell? At least two of them that you want to tell us today. The, the story? Yeah, that's, yeah, that the, is one of the, them. The yeah, it, the it's, not, it's not exactly a SAR, it's a search. <laughs> there was a race, it was in 99, it was in uh, the 18th of October 99 in the English Channel. And there was a race called Transat Transatlantic, Jacques Vabre, coming Trans, from the transatlantic. transatlantic. Yeah. Jacques Vabre is the name of the race. Okay. So there are many uh, single hull, catamarans, etc. doing this race. It's, it's starting from Le Havre in Normandy okay. to Cartagena in Colombia. So they cross the Atlantic. That's, that's a long trip. Yeah. And it's in October. Late October, the weather is not so fun. The uh, race managers hesitated to give the start of the race, but finally they, they found a, a window to start the race. So they start in the afternoon. And uh, at, so the, the skippers had to give some uh, calls at some reporting points. And one of the skippers didn't do that, uh, leaving the English Channel just close by the uh, England islands, English islands in okay. the west of Normandy, Jersey, Guernsey, and Alderney. Okay. There was no call. So it was 21 p.m. It was, tw it was uh, sorry, 9 p.m. Yeah. 2100. 2100. Yeah. So no reply. So now... The race managers called the RCC and the RCC called us. They said, we have a missing ship from this race. Uh, we don't know where it is. It's late at night. It's dark and windy. Uh, luckily, the visibility was quite good. So, so we took off. We put full fuel. We took off with the Dolphin and went to the west of Normandy, but we didn't know where to go exactly. Right, right. <laughs> So I began a kind of um, ladder search on a fictive point, trying to go from east to west of the English Channel. Just based on? Based on where they should be. Yeah. Okay. By, by the race 
manager's calculation nice. estimation. So this is something to bring up. So you made the, the call to do the ladder search. And did you design a, the whole ladder search in the aircraft? Like as So as at this time, we had only one GPS, no needles, nothing. Okay. We had to do this mentally. We were held by the GPS. Okay. The copilot was building up, but we had no screen. So you had to do everything manually. Manually, system. yeah. Now, my question is, did the RCC help you guys at all and say, hey, this is your search pattern? Or did you guys... No, did this you is our decision. All, oh, wow. They, they are not involved in that. They just give us where to go yeah. and what we have to search. And then they are hanging on us. Wow. So I did this. And... Uh, I was calling the the ship's names was Brosseliand. Okay. Brosseliand is the name of a forest in Brittany. Oh, okay. is where Merlin. Oh, Merlin. You know, Merlin. Yes, Merlin. This yes. is the forest of Merlin. Oh, hey. You see? The magician Merlin. Magi yeah. <laughs> so. The one that helped uh, Lancelot. Exactly, yeah. yeah. This, this yeah. is the legend, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and the legend was there in this forest called Brosseliand. Yeah. So this ship, this big one, a uh, catamaran, uh, was not on string. So I was calling Borsellian. This is French Navy uh, correction. This is Gepard Heathcray, the Coast Guard helicopter, calling you on channel 16 and calling you on channel 68 because this is the emergency also. The okay. And nothing. And I spent maybe an hour doing that. And suddenly I get a, a reply. He said, yeah, it's Brosselian. I said, I'm looking for you since an hour. Uh, you didn't report your position to the, to the race managers. He said, yeah, we capsized. We are now upside down. The mast is broken and I am sitting on the, on the hull. <laughs> so he could go outside by a trap. Yeah. He went outside. The, the name of this guy is a famous one. He's, he's called Alain Gauthier. Okay. And the other skipper was still inside is Michel Desjoyaux. They are very famous uh, skippers in, uh, and racers. So this guy tells me, I cannot help you. I don't know where I'm at because I don't have any portable GPS. It's just a fixed one and, and it's under the water now. So I said, that's weird <laughs> because, <laughs> okay, well, do you see something? Do you see some heavy light, white light somewhere? He said, yes, I see some lights, the halo of a light. And he, he says, it looks like I'm in the northwest of a very big uh, factory yeah. transforming the nuclear, uh, the nuclear waste. Oh, OK. So like the, this is a very famous one in Normandy. OK. Uh, it's it's like pretty much a power plant. It's not a nuclear power plant. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's doing electricity with that, but it's also uh, 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 treating the nuclear waste of many nuclear oh, plants. Wow, okay, okay. So it's it's a very bright factory. So he said, I'm probably northwest of La Cogema. Okay. I said, okay, that's good because that gives me uh, an axis to search around. So now I am leaving my later search and yeah. going on the axis search. Okay. And, uh, so now you've changed the search pattern in the It aircraft. sounds a search pattern, so but now it's not a very conventional yeah. one. It's just a straight line. <laughs> and your, your co pilot's like, I just put in all these numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but I was using those numbers. I was using that. Good job, co pilot. <laughs> so, so then we went to this uh, straight line search. And by the radar, I, I couldn't detect this very weak echo. So I could detect tankers in the in this English channel, cargo ships, etc. Right. but nothing well, very consistent. And like you and I talked about like earlier that once the vessel's upside down, so it, you're not gonna get a radar bounce mm, off anything with there it. There is no no big surface to right. reflect the, no. the energy of the uh, of the radar. So you have nothing. So I, I had an idea. I, I told him uh, I'm I'm going to your zone but I I cannot I cannot see you on the radar, so let's do something. I will switch on all my lights, the sunlight, the three landing lights, yeah. everything, all my strobes, everything, and I will circle. And tell me when you see my lights. So it took one minute and he said, yeah, I see you. I said, okay, I stopped my turn. 
I will turn to the opposite. Tell me when you see me. I see you. And we were doing a kind of light homing. <laughs> it was guiding me. So very quickly, I was on the proper axis to go towards this position. Yeah. So I told him, do you have a lamp on you? And he said, yes, I have a, it's not very bright. But so I said, switch it on and make like uh, flashes. Yeah, flash it. Are you guys flying with night vision goggles at this point? Uh, or... Only the uh, on because this no we were not on the front we didn't have yet the uh, the uh, capability oh, it, yeah. the, the aircraft was not capable okay only the uh, hoist operator was then we went but yeah only the, operator. At the time so now uh, I see the flash of his lamp so now <laughs> we are okay I tell him okay we are on your way now and. Maybe five minutes after we were on top, I reported the RCC. We found this guy. I gave the light and long coordinates because there was a towing ship, a very big one, on standby for the race, not so far from the uh, English islands. So when he knew that there was a, a one missing, he was going to the English Channel full speed. So I hoisted my rescue swimmer on board. Yeah. He talked to this guy. And this guy refused to be hoisted. He didn't want to abandon ship. So I left my swimmer on board and circle around until the ship is going close by and then picked up my my rescue swimmer and told him bye bye. We did our job <laughs> and it was a funny one. Just the, the lesson to learn because as everybody knows, the SAR mission is it's impossible to put a SAR mission, typical one, in a book. Yeah. Uh, we have techniques that is pretty much standard, even worldwide. But the uh, the common sense and the imagination is also a good thing in SAR. <laughs> Using the lights, right. doing light homer, homing, and uh, uh, speakers, sending, whatever yeah, you've got on your aircraft. Sending yeah. the, uh, calling this guy in the air until, yeah, you will do that. I've, maybe I've done that 100 times. Yeah. But the 101, he replied. Yeah. So a good lesson also is be patient. Things will happen. That's, yeah. that's awesome. I love the fact that Swarmer went down. I was like, what's up? You want to come with me? Not really. Okay, I'll no. see you later. And this, this guy spent the night. He didn't want to be transferred on the on the towing ship. He spent the night on his hull. Totally sitting on top of the hull. Sit on top like on a horse. I showed you the picture. <laughs> Just riding it. Yeah, you One saw. Side. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? You saw his picture. So oh my God. And the next day we came back. He was still on his hull, and we took some pictures as well. Say hello, and uh, looking forward uh, if we can be, we could be useful. And then we left. If it had been me, I would have swam up to him like, hey, do you order a pizza? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, pizza, uh, uh, a bottle of wine, and that's it. Yeah, right. Mm. Hey, can you bring me a newspaper? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do with the on the fishing vessels. Yeah. Most of the time they were, at this time there was no internet, etc. So they were at sea having no news, etc. So... Usually when we uh, went to uh, search and rescue or medevac yeah. on a fishing vessel at sea, we used to do a transfer with the, with the rescue swimmer. We used to transfer with him a bottle of wine and a bunch of newspapers for them to be busy, to have good news. Wow. And in exchange, because they are always good gentlemen, yeah. we had a lot of fishes or crabs coming back to the, <laughs> to the aircraft. <laughs> That is brilliant. Yeah. You know, a bottle of wine and the newspaper to the boys out at sea. Hey, they were so go. happy to have the newspapers <laughs> because they just have the radio and they had no internet, nothing at this time. So they were so happy to have four or five newspapers. Wow. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. I love it. I love it, was, it. That was the thing that the, the, the sea workers and the... the search and rescue units, whatever, air, air, sea, whatever. Yeah. They are always uh, in always in a, in a good uh, synergy or good relationship. relationship. Yeah, very much so. 
Because I always felt that as well, it, yeah. especially like the aviation side that, that I've experienced throughout my career is the the boat world really embraced and really loved the our Coast Guard Airedales because they know if they're making a phone call and they, you know you hear a helicopter coming, we're coming yeah. to help you. And the yeah. helicopter is coming within yeah. less than an hour. Yeah. So that's that's very important for them that to know that they they have something to help them. Yeah within a very short time period. Right, right. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> I love it. Plus, if they know they're getting a bottle of wine and a, and a couple yeah. of newspapers, that's even better. Uh, I think they, they are not... For a and then when you get down here, say, nah, I'm okay. Can we get a bottle of wine? <laughs> <laughs> I think when they go at sea, they have the stock. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. just like... A, sure of it. <laughs> that's a good thing to bring them a bottle of wine. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So that's that's one good uh, memorable case. What else you got? Oh uh, no, I don't have anything more. Uh, no, I don't have any other. Just what I wanted to say is this uh, this imagination we should have during a SAR. We yeah. have conventional patterns: ladder, sector, expanding square, square. But when all this runs out, you have to imagine some uh, some other. Be creative. Be, yeah, you must be creative. Exactly. Yeah, think yeah. outside the box. Yeah, like Thanks. you started. You know, and out, so here's where where I, I'm I'm on board with that is you start with your training. You start with the baseline. You started with a ladder search. You went to your sector search. You know, yeah, and then you divert from there, and and you yeah. you went around to the area. Yeah, things first, that make sense. Yeah, and first of all, you have the experience of the guy also is counting a lot. For example, if you don't have an accurate position, you will never do a search, a sector search. You will begin by at least a ladder search. Yeah. If it's windy or there is a big current, sea current. Yeah. Or you will go directly to an expanding square which is uh, for an helicopter very demanding yeah because you have to f you have to cover a super long distance right so especially when you start getting outside the middle of the square now exactly gonna, it's you, getting longer and right, longer right. between the between the legs yeah so it's not really very adapted to the helicopter especially those with the short range uh, flight time which is like uh, for a dolphin you can fly two hours and a half yeah so you with an expanding square you, you finally don't fly over a big area yeah. doing an expanding square what we do in the navy when we, what we are aiming to is to use a fixed wing fixed wing for that ah. and the fixed wing is searching okay and when they get something they send the helicopter to pick up okay that's what uh, probably even the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard are doing, use the best asset at the best moment, at the right. best time. Well, yeah. I, there are a lot of times where, like the C-130, uh, yes, uh, the Kodiak would go out, they'd do a search, and they'd be like, "Hey, exactly. we found something. Boom, we're following." Right exactly, behind. because the zone is very wide, yeah. so they are they can fly 13, 15 hours. Yeah, yeah. So and then they use the helicopter to uh, as a final asset to pick up. Right. So, but when you are alone. Sometimes you can share the zone like we did with CHC searching. So we define two squares and one is acting in his own, in his own square. Yeah. And we report, did you see something? No. Okay, I'm done with this square. Let's take another. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, wow. that's yeah. awesome. So that's what I wanted to say. We have, we have to be creative at some point. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. Great advice. I mean, Heck, even, and this kind of brings up where you and I have kind of met and trained together. It's it's such a wonderful um, thing for me personally because, you know, you come from a, a similar background as I do, but a very different background than I do. And I, I remember specifically going on a training flight with you and we were talking about tagline use. And we, and I had said, because I was hoisting, I said, all right, tagline's away. And the next thing you know, we're hoisting again, and hey, tagline's away. And I remember you looking back after like the fourth time I said it, you're like, how many freaking ropes do we have back there? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, that's the same rope. 
But the fact that you knew exactly what was going on, there was no, there was no trying to interpret, hey, I have a tagline attached. You know, yes, I have a tagline that's connected to the ground, mm -hmm. and now I'm connected to Yeah, that. I know what you're doing, exactly. exactly. We have the same techniques exactly. worldwide. So the guiding, uh, the guidance is, is quite the same. Yeah. The distance is in France, we say in meters, but internationally we say go forward 20 and we know we can evaluate at the first sight. Okay, 20 for this guy means this distance. Yes. I know. So yeah. 10 will be approximately there, 5 will be here. Right. That's it. I don't need meters, I don't need yards, I don't need carrots, I don't need dollars. No. It's just no. the simple way and everybody is able to adapt yeah. from whatever background. Yeah. Having to fly with specialists, whatever pilots, rescue swimmer, and hoist operators, we are more or less on the same frequency. We are very much. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. You know, and like the only thing that I will say with, with any operation that we get into, like here, is let's use that tagline example. You know, you had a question of like, hey, how many taglines do you have back there? Yeah. It was a question from the pilot to the air crew. And I, I hope that I was able to explain it to you. Yeah. Oh, you know what? We're using the same one. So it's a quick interpretation and then a quick fix. So we yep. are all on the same page. Yeah. If there's any question, again, that comes back to CRM. But the difference about like the terminology from French versus the U.S. Where, where I did all my stuff is, even though it's a little different, like you said, it's still the same. Well, that's, yeah. that's just so cool to me. I, yeah. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So. The best thing should be to do the guidance, everything in French. That would be helpful oh, yeah, for yeah. me. Do everything in French, yeah. Okay, bonjour. Because, that's uh, a lot of okay, French that's French a good way. one. <laughs> and tag, for me, tagline away, something away is, is gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was gone, I promise. It was just coming back. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. So, no, yeah. I, I, I really... I, I was digging that. I, I, I enjoy flying with you very much just because of your experience and, you know, even this talking about your, you know, five o'clock hoisting mm -hmm. the vessel, having the vessel kind of surf the wave. That's, you yeah. know, that, that's just a different, a different technique that works. That so, works because the, the ship can still, has uh, still his engines. Yeah. Uh, what you cannot do is when an, a ship has, is unable to, uh, get some speed like a ship with an engine failure yeah. or a sailing ship with uh, sails destroyed what will do the ship it will mandatory go across the swell right parallel to the swell sorry parallel to the swell right so and this is one of the pitch. most exactly that's yeah. one of the most difficult thing to do a transfer for example on a sailing ship at night yeah. with so high mast and being unable to have very good reference from the pilot's side. This is why we used to drop the swimmer most of the time in the water, ask the skipper to, to throw a, a, a rope in order for the swimmer to grab the rope and be, uh, be uh, pulled in the ship from the water. Got it. Because on the mast, there is always cables and uh, the big risk is to injure the right. rescue swimmer during the descent. Once in on the ship, there is no problem because we have the tagline. If it's not away, <laughs> so we have the tagline. So now we can yeah. move away from the ship, and we do all with the tagline, yeah. having a very good reference from us. Right, and now and you just keep the tagline attached. To uh, always. Or, and uh, do you guys call it a tagline or guideline? There, there is uh, multiple trail line, uh, uh, a lot of different yeah. terms, but a rope. The rope is connected we, to we call this the rope but in, yeah. in france in french yeah yeah how, how do you say it in french la, la corde le boot le, le boot, boot. <laughs> le boot attached le boot away <laughs> so we used to to take that and it's a very good technique because yeah. it gives the pilot enough room to keep a very good uh reference general reference of, of what is floating without impacting uh, without impacting the safety and whatever has to be transferred a stretcher uh, yeah. two human bodies etc is done by the tagline yeah the only difficult thing as always to 
I always been to drop the swimmer and pick up the swimmer right. because nobody will take care. The tagline is something very sensitive. I've seen some guys helping the swimmer on the ship, attaching the tagline on the ship, <laughs> which is very dangerous because then you can break the tagline. Right. There is a fuse. Yeah. So and now you have no tagline. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so it's always the big difficult part. If the if the rescue swimmer can brief perfectly the 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 crew of the of the ship, then yes, the pickup is easy because they will hold the tagline. We will raise the the swimmer and take the tagline. But doing the uh, the tagline first on a ship is always risky. Right. We drop the swimmer. Physically. Well, I like the idea about getting into the water and. And going up, you know, getting pulled the ship, asking the captain and skipper yeah, to throw to the pull. line. I, I'm talking about a sailing ship, huh? right, a, a right, small right. ship, right. not not a cargo, of course. No, no, no. And, mm. you know, I, yeah, no, yeah. Um, the your rescue swimmers in France, they they remain connected to the hook for the most part. Is that accurate? So when you when when we do a survivor hoisting in the water, yes. He always stay connected. We never, okay. he never jumped from the helicopter. Okay. Even, so that's, even, so, even if so he's swimming too. Swimming connected to the helicopter. Right? Yes. Okay. So they are really, yeah, it's really demanding because yeah. even though it's just a cable, it's, it's really slowing them down in, in their swim. Yes. So after a minute or two, they are done. So we drop the swimmer. If we have someone in the water to rescue, yes. we never go on top of it, of the guy. We keep always the flying pilot, always keep the visual of the survivor, okay. even at night. Okay. It's, it's in the beam. Yep. It happened to me several times. I keep that in the beam of the light. Okay. Yep. So then the swimmer swims to the guy. So I am doing CRM now. I'm telling what I see also to the, the rescue hoist operator. Okay. I say, okay, I see the swimmer. The swimmer is giving the... Collar, how do you call it? Uh, quick strap, the strap, the, strap, the quick yes, strap. The yep. uh, now it's giving the signal to raise. And they now I will lose the visual because the, the hoist operator will drag them yeah. underneath the, the helicopter and then pull them out of the water. Wow, nice. So nice. we always have a reference, even day or night, yeah. we always keep, this is the French technique, right, right. French Navy, French Coast Guard. We we'll always keep the visual in order not to be disoriented right. and having some uh, unwanted uh, reflex with yeah. the flying the helicopter. Right. So we always have this reference. Yeah. And we see the swimmer coming. Yep. We just comment it. We comment what has, what's happening. So you're telling the flight back what you see. And, then, and he's all, also in touch with that. He's looking yeah. outside. Yeah. But we have this for the other, if the, the co-pilot must be also aware of what's happening. And if there is someone else in the aircraft, you must be aware. So yeah. he's attaching the, the, he's giving the quick strap and now he's giving the signal. So now the rescue hoist operator says, I'm dragging them. Oh, and when I lose the vision, say visual lost. Yeah. So now he knows yeah, that, no that I'm no longer having some good reference. Yeah. So it's better to be fast I can't even say I'm going slightly forward because now they are in the air. You have no idea, right? So that's another. By day we never move. Yeah. By night, we, if it's a bit bumpy, we can just can just say I'm going ten knots forward, just not to be disoriented. Wow. That's it. Man, that's that's some uh, that's some good stuff right there. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. You have a lot to as a feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I have, um, I have, I, I have a lot of, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? I have a lot of different opinions on staying connected to the hook, getting off the hook, you yeah. know, and I, I, I actually like both. I like staying on the hook for a, a deployment, for a quick stop or for a quick in and out. Um, I also like the availability of getting off the hook to have an option, uh, just another option. Yeah. Yeah, and the, it's also just a, a question of policy, of the yeah. operator's policy. Right, for right. us, we never unhook. Yeah. That was forbidden for any reason. But yeah. I don't have the reason. Maybe it's because if the swimmer gets bad, he's still it's connected. Hard. Yeah. Sometimes we have, 
we have some assistance to provide to fishing vessels. Sometimes they get their net in. Right, right. In the, in the, in the propellers. Right. Next so you know your swimmer stuck in the gear. Yeah. So yeah. what's happening is uh, uh, we had that one time, and the, the net is very hard to cut. Right. So we got this guy still on the on the hook because when the net got separated it can drive the it's so heavy it can drive the swimmer down wow yeah so yeah, exactly they always have to be two in that case so yeah. we my swimmer never went to a net disengagement alone we used to take some uh, deminers we had deminers in duty okay. in the in the military harbor close by the the station okay we take them mm. And they are here to cut, and the swim, our swimmer was with them to help. Wow. Yeah, so and they all monitor themselves. Okay. Not to be sure that nobody is engaged with some, like some part of the net in the bottles or yeah. whatever. Yeah, we get two guys in, down the At water. At least two. Yeah. There were sometimes three. Wow. Wow. To disengage because it's very, very tough. A yeah. net is very tough, so they have to use so, <laughs> so the net. Power. Yeah, power. <laughs> <laughs> That's so there's it. a little joke there. I, I'm going to tell everybody it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so I get in the helicopter with, with Terry and we're getting ready to take off. And uh, I think you're sitting left seat and he's calling power. So the 139, as you're, you're calling power, it was power, 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 <laughs> TDP, <or rotate. laughs> With my French accent. <laughs> It's too late. I will not change that. <laughs> you know what? I don't want to change it at all because I absolutely love it. And it makes me smile every time I get in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, man. Timmy, I can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, sharing you. the stories, man. This, is, this has been a pleasure. Been yeah, awesome. thank you very much for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, this is awesome. So until the next time, we yeah. get together and go okay. find some more. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, bye. And that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and like my daughters like to tell me, like and subscribe. Oh, yeah. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story that they would be willing to share... I would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest. Or if you have any questions about any of the rescues or anything else that we talk about here on this podcast, send me an email, therealrescue at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our Facebook and Instagram page at The Real Rescue. That's at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. I also want to give a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember that when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.